Cat and Moose podcast. I'm Cat and I'm Moose. This is a true life podcast where we explore the quirks of being human. Hey, Cat. Hey, Moose. Hey, Sarah. Ouch. Hi, guys. <laughs> what happened, Sarah? I, I don't know. My wrist just locked up for no reason at all. Aww. Have we? <laughs> Have we talked about how Sarah loves to talk about her boo-boos? Yes, we have <laughs> talked about that. It's so true. And I, <laughs> I think it's very sweet. <laughs> um, Kat, why does your Zoom name say number 14279? You know why? Because that is the number of my license to be a massage therapist. Woo! You got your letter. It's official. It's official. Did you get your whatever it's called to be able to do it in your building? I got my go to work letter, which means that I can be paid to do body work now, which is really cool. Um, and um, no, my establishment license has not been granted yet. Oh, you had. It's I coming. don't know. We will turn you in. No, if I coming. find out that anyone in there is getting a paid massage, you are in deep trouble. I know it. I know it. I won't do it. It's against my ethical guidelines. <laughs> I've got some Monday motivation I can share with you guys. Oh, let's hear it. <laughs> what? Yeah. Monday motivation? Uh-huh. Okay. Give it to us. Hi. Oh, my goodness. No one's coming to save you. Yeah, no one's coming to save you. Here's a cup of love. Drink up and joy. You're going to have to save yourself. Here's your Monday motivation. Be your own advocate, baby. You can, and you're worth that. I love you so much. Keep moving forward. You're doing a fantastic job. And of course, negativity, be gone. Yes. Oh. <laughs> wow. Yeah. This guy is so funny. He's He is BWB positivity, Bruce W. Brackett, and he's freaking hilarious, and he just sends out little positivity moments like that great oh, I liked him yeah I like him too I think it is true nobody's coming to save you although I really would love for someone to <laughs> <laughs> but then like what would you do uh, honestly I would lay there and eat grapes and drink Kool-Aid or something <laughs> I mean you could do that now that's true and save myself that feels exhausting <laughs> well i feel like you were feeling pretty good last night laying on my pool deck having some points held <laughs> guys my god are we, are we allowed to talk about that on the podcast or is that client confidentiality hippa stuff yeah I think. don't share my jen Shindo points with the world please <laughs> <laughs> What points were they? Because it was something to do with my stomach and needing to learn to receive nourishment. Yes. Yes. And, and are you okay talking about it, Moose? Yes. Okay. Well, um, my intention was to be supporting the energy flow in your body that has to do with your organ, the stomach and balancing it with your organ, the spleen. Mm -hmm. um, and the stomach basically is responsible for receiving nourishment and the spleen is responsible for distributing that nourishment to where it needs to go in the body. And I was saying that you might consider that um, you might have either a whole lot of nourishment or you might need to like kind of slow down and be able to receive some nourishment after pouring out so much this week. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I liked that. I thought that was good. I, I told Sarah the other day that <clears throat> I can't remember exactly what I was doing, but it was something very like technical with my hands that I needed to be specific about. And I don't remember what it was. But mm -hmm. I said out loud, it's been a long time since I've just taken the amount of time that it takes to do something. Mm. And wow. that was like a moment for me because I don't realize until I do that, how much I'm always rushing or always like getting ready for something or anticipating something. So when you mm. said that to me, I was like, okay what if I do take the, whatever time it needs 
in order mm-hmm. to do so. I, I re- that's like a foreign idea to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like I can really relate to that because I, I have a hard time doing that too. And I try really hard to let Fridays be that for me. Mm-hmm. And they rarely are, but I, I try hard. I start, I start my day with like my normal, like coffee and poop and take the dogs oh out. Oh my and gosh. Kind of, yeah, I mean, it just is a good way to start the day. Uh-huh. And then I typically go to a body work session where I receive body work. And then I try to take the rest of the day to just kind of like do stuff for me, whether that's organize my email inbox or whether that's, you know, vacuuming out my car or like whatever needs to happen. And why does that feel so foreign, Noose? Uh, I don't know. For me, I just don't ever think about enjoying the process. <laughs> like <laughs> it, I do. I'm starting to understand being present, but even when I'm present, like I'm aware of outer, outer things. And it's hard for me just to stay inner. Does that make sense? Um, maybe try to say it in a different way. Like, um, I don't know how to say it in a different way. Can you ask another question? (laughs) Um, Why does it sometimes seem hard to make the time and space that you need for the things that you need? Um, Well, I think it really goes back to thinking I deserve to take the time and space. Mm, So you don't think you deserve it. Well, I, I, I think that's the root of it. Like if you were to ask me that, I'd be like, of course I deserve it, but it's just not what I'm an, I'm an eight on the Enneagram as we know, or we don't know, but, um, and that means that efficiency is really important to me. Mm -hmm. So like, why would I, if I'm cleaning the house, I'm not going to be the person that's like, I'm going to go in the office and do a little this and then go in the kitchen. Like, I'm going to be in the office and get it done. And then I'm going to tackle this. Like it's all about efficiency. Um, So that may play into it as well, because my nature is to like do the thing and then be done. So you can move on to something else. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know, this is like a new practice for me to just be like, Oh, I have the room to just do this. And however long it takes, you can actually find enjoyment in that. That's a new concept. Well, that's really cool. And it it kind of reminds me of what we've talked about before about how what is familiar, like we think is comfortable and what is familiar we view as uncomfortable when actually like, like actually having the time and space to do the thing could actually be really comfortable if it was more familiar. I agree. I think that's the other thing. You know, I'm in, I am officially in grad school. I decided to make that an announcement instead of, that's the other thing. I don't celebrate a lot of things. So I was about to say, so in grad school, but so I, I mean, I'm one week deep guys. And let me tell you that I am in the deep end of this, but one of the things that I am learning, uh, one of the classes I'm taking is in like organizational change which I think is super fun. Um, But that is exactly what I'm learning about is like how difficult it is to approach um, employees about something that needs change because so many people really don't want change. They would rather have something stay familiar and, you know, like they're at capacity and it's not, you know, the employee's fault. Like many of these people are already at capacity. So to ask them to learn a new system or anything else is really, really freaky. And so I get that because I've been in that position, but also like imagine your productivity if you could get everyone onboarded. And so it's that same idea, <laughs> basically onboarding yourself, mm-hmm. you know, and being like, oh, this is a thing. It's new, but let's try it. You know, I like to say anything like that. It's a new hobby. Like, oh, guess what we're doing this week? We're going to take as much time as something needs or as something, you know, if it's an enjoyable thing, take as much time as you want. Yeah. Yeah. And that just, again, back to the the point that, that we started with is that like that feels so abnormal to me. That feels so unfamiliar. Mm-hmm. And when I take the time to do it, it feels good. 
Mm. So it is unfamiliar for both of you. It is for me. Mm-hmm. Same for you. Yeah. Um, well, that's good to know because maybe that's, you know, the difference. We're not machines. We are humans and we can't just keep going, 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 going. It doesn't work that way. Right. And it makes me think that like, maybe also like we run with our herd, you know, yeah. like like attracts like, and it's like, all of us are like, let's go get it. Let's go do it. Let's be awesome. You know? Mm-hmm. And, um, when I think about herds, it makes me think that somebody told me this week and it's the first time that I'd heard this phrase. Um, so, um, have you heard the phrase moose knuckles? Oh my God. Are we really doing this? I mean, I had never heard it before. Are you serious? I had never heard it. Come on. And I'm like, how are we the cat and moose podcast? And we've never talked about moose knuckles. I feel like we have to have covered this somewhere along the way. Uh, yeah, no, I, don't, I don't know that we have. And if we have, I completely forgot about it because I, I just, when someone said this to me this week, I was actually talking to them about our podcast and they were like, do you guys talk about moose knuckles? And I'm like, I don't know what that means. And they were like, oh, I, moose. And I was like, I still don't get it. And then they were like, does moose have moose knuckles? And I was like, no. Oh my gosh. Who said that? Cause I will whoop them. You are officially banned from the podcast if you ask if I have them. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. This person may not uh, re-enter my orbit for a really long time. Well, look, guys, we're not going to tell you what they are. You're going to have to Google them because (laughs) I am not hashtagging that phrase on this episode. Moose knuckle is a slang term for when the outline of a man's genitalia are visible through particularly tight or hiked up clothing. Essentially, it is a man's version of a camel toe. That sounds absolutely amazing. So will you hashtag child on a leash? Absolutely, I will. I'm writing it down as we speak. (laughs) Hashtag child on leash. Got it? So one of the things that our listeners have asked for is they have said, like, we would love for you guys to talk about your real jobs as if the podcast is not a real job. And let's be honest, it's not. It's just fun, right? Like, it's it's a lot of fun. It's a big job for Sarah. But for me, anyway, it's really fun. <laughs> um, so I was doing my real job this week and I had to travel to Texas And I was in an airport and I was watching this couple um, and their little toddler who was old enough to be walking. So I'm thinking kind of in like the two to three year old range. And they had the child on a leash. And I just really I spent quite a good bit of time just studying these people and their child. And I just wanted to bring this up to you guys. Like, how do you feel about children on a leash? Well, I hear it's like a big thing like debate (laughs) oh really (laughs) in the parenting circles this one's a big debate (laughs) okay so tell us what you were going to share about kid on a leash well i mean it's not even that much it was just more about like what do you think about it because like as i was studying this family i was thinking well that's kind of convenient yeah you know it's like the child cannot get away and i I have a toddler in my life who like he he i mean there's just it's completely unpredictable it's like where's the child gonna go you know and so um we always talk about how like we love when he gets to go to my mom's house because she's got like acres and acres of land and he can just like run and go wild and kind of not really hurt himself you know and and in the airport where it would be really advantageous to keep your toddler close to you like having a leash makes sense and the child seemed to just be like well okay like this is how far i can go like this it's kind of it it kind of reminded me of like my dogs it's like my dogs know that when their leash runs out like either they're gonna like break their necks or they need to stop you know and and i'm not trying to say that children and dogs are the same i know that they're not um and at the same time like i was just really fascinated at like i I guess i've always been like really judgy about people that put leashes on their children and it, it for some reason in this moment in the dallas airport i was like i really have an appreciation for this child being on a leash and not like running over to me and being like, hello, Auntie Cat, like, you know, give me a Coca-Cola, you know? <laughs> give me a Coca-Cola. <laughs> I 
totally agree. I think I used to be super judgy, but now that I have had a toddler in my life, I'm like, why would you not put it on a leash? Yeah. 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 I said it. Right. Well, are you just being gender sensitive? Mm -hmm. Yes. You know me. Yeah. Um, Okay. So I have a question for you guys. Okay. How judgy are you on a scale of one to five? Just in general, like when you're people watching, what happens in your mind? Hmm. It, it really depends on the, it, it really depends on the moment and the setting for me. Like I can be super, super judgmental mm-hmm. and I also can just have like, well, I guess I'm still being judgmental if I have compassion. So I guess I'm just really judgmental. Sometimes I just have more <laughs> compassion. <laughs> what about you, Sarah? Uh, I, I feel the same. It depends on the scenario. Um, and sometimes I can be super judgy and at the person's expense funny. And other times I'm like super compassionate. So yeah, it just depends. What about you? Uh, same. I'm, I mean, aren't we all just a little freaking judgy, even if it doesn't come (laughs) out of our mouth, like just the thoughts in my mind sometimes Mm. are like so insensitive. You know what I mean? Like I'll see something and I'll be like, why? And then I'm like, so I'm starting to do this thing. (laughs) I also have been traveling a bit and seeing a lot more people for work. And, um, I'm finding myself just, and and this is totally just being honest. I didn't know this was there. So (laughs) this is really good that I'm having the recognition. I think I love weird people like the weirder, the better for me. Oh yeah. And so like, and I, I know that's because I also am weird. Um, but then there are times where there's a different flavor of weird (laughs) that would still be in the giant bucket of weird, but it's different from mine. Right. That sometimes I look at and go like, I don't get it. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? And (laughs) I don't get it totally means, you know, judgmental. Right. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I'm recognizing this about myself and I'm, I'm trying to be open to what I can learn from that. And so this is my new practice when I have that feeling of like, I don't get it. You know, like that voice in my head. (laughs) Um, I'm starting to like pause and say, you are a part of me. Mm. Hmm. Because my thought process in that is we all know it comes back to our own insecurity when we see somebody being really boldly who they are. Mm -hmm. And so I I just, this this is my new phrase. You are a part of me. And what I'm doing is reminding myself, I wouldn't really have any judgment towards others unless I felt that exact same way with myself. Mm. And so doing that, it does that, but then it also helps me recognize like, you know, through all of this parts work, often we're, we're just expressing one part of ourselves, Mm -hmm. you know, and externally, there's so much more complexity underneath all of that. And so now I'm like celebrating and, you know, I can embrace weird. I can't always embrace like the, uh, bachelorettes downtown Nashville. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Yeah. Like there's a certain flavor that I'm just like, I don't get it, but I'm starting to go, well, good for you. And I used to do that sarcastically. And now I'm trying to do it sincerely. Like (laughs) you were bold enough to wear a jean skirt with cowboy boots on a moving hot tub on a moving hot tub and that's your 12th tequila yeah now that sounds like judgment but now i'm gonna flip it guys and i'm gonna say good for you because somewhere along the way you're gonna learn a lesson there and and you're gonna grow and you're growing in different ways than i'm growing and then all of a sudden i am Yin Yang. <laughs> That's amazing. Like <laughs> that is a beautiful life Thank balance. You. Like uh that's just so epic, Moose. Thank you for that. That You're is welcome. awesome. It makes me wonder. Um we got a, a YouTube link from one of our uh dear listeners and friends, Amanda, this week. And I don't know if you've had a chance to watch it or not, mm-hmm. but it was um it was from a channel on YouTube and maybe it exists elsewhere, but what what she sent was YouTube, a channel called T plus H, which is tragedy and hope. Um, and basically it was about people who had near death experiences or people who 
um, well, I guess it would be the same thing. Like people talking about like kind of reincarnation and rebirth and, yeah. and stuff like that. And it made me think like, um, it's like, we kind of, we kind of are part of one another, you know, yes. it's like mm-hmm. this really famous dude, um, Alan Watts. Do you know about Alan Watts? Oh yeah. I know of Alan Watts. I've heard okay. a lot of philosophers quote him. Yeah. I don't, I, I don't know anything about him until today. And he was like a, basically like an entertainment philosopher is what a lot of people called him. Um, and really studied like, um, you know, Buddhism, but then also was like an ordained priest in the Episcopal church and like was really Mm -hmm. into like religion and psychology and physiology and, and all this kind of stuff. And one of the things that he said is he said, there are two statements that I believe are both true. And one is that after I die, I shall be reborn as a baby and forget my former life. Whoa. Hmm. His second statement is after I die, a baby will be born. Wow. Wow. And so his question to us in this, you know, thing that I was watching is, is there a difference in those statements? Hmm. Well, it doesn't feel like to me, there's a difference. There's just a different filter laid on top. Ooh, say more. Hmm. Well, the first one just comes across as a little more Mm woo-woo. Like it's putting it in a specific category. It's suggesting I believe in reincarnation. Mm -hmm. And the second one probably makes people feel the most comfortable. Yeah, that's a really good point, Moose. I didn't look at it like that. Mm. Like I was like, which one of these do I believe? You know, is like is like where my head went. And um and and I loved his point of that if there is not consciousness, it, it, the question is almost like does it matter? Hmm. Right. Like does right. reincarnation matter if you don't know that you've been reincarnated? Uh-huh. And they were telling all these stories of like this one kid, for example, when he was really, really young, he told his parents, like, I miss Hollywood. I uh, miss being yeah. in Hollywood and I miss dancing on stage and I miss being in the movies. And they were like, what is this kid talking about? And this kid remembered a former life and knew things that he couldn't possibly know hmm. without having lived that former life, you know, mm-hmm. like, and, and to me, I was like, Oh my gosh, like this is just like mind bending amazing. And it made me think of this Carl Jung quote that I read this week. And I'm really curious to get your take on it. Okay, I love me some Carl Jung, so hit it. Okay. Until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. I mean, that is a, that's a whole Oprah masterclass. <laughs> Can you read it again? Until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. Wow. Hmm. I mean, there's so many ways you can go here. There really is, and it makes me think of your you're talking about being judgmental or not being judgmental about the the bride or the bridesmaids or whatever mm-hmm. down on Broadway. You know, it's like, it's like in, until like you go like, okay, I, I find a place where I cannot have judgment about this, then really like what will come of that person in your mind is, is truth to you. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You know, exactly. And what is that doing to me to have that towards other people? Right. I mean, right. If that's not like enlightenment, I don't know what is Mm -hmm. like. So to the young quote, so the making the I love breaking things down like this was my favorite part of like English class. Mm -hmm. Um, So if we're making the unconscious conscious, what we're doing there is having awareness. Yes. And then what's the second half of that quote? Until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. Okay. So what it's saying is if you're walking around 
not yeah. having any awareness. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. That ignorance is bliss. Mm-hmm. Then that which you are not aware of. <laughs> sorry for anyone that's like, I already got it 12 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. So I'm glad we're here. I'm glad we're here. Look, we, we break this shit down in <laughs> real time, guys. So if you are not aware to what is around you, what is happening inside of you, all the things and the interconnectedness of all of that, then your ignorance, if you will, your unawareness is what is directing your life and you're going, well, that's just how... So be it. So thus saith the Lord. So be it. So yes. Well, it is. Yeah. That must be God's will. Mm. Oh, mercy. Merciful heavens. Mm. Yeah. And then we, when, then we bring, we bring the divine into it yeah. and that's where it gets real scary. Well, guess what? You just gave me the perfect segue to something I want to share. Oh, good. Great. Um, I'm going to share this and then I'm going to go here. I want you guys to listen to what this chick says. I was called to, to spiritual practice and, and wellness and yoga and meditation because I was recovering from Catholicism because I, I felt betrayed yes. by the church yeah. in many right. ways. And then I felt betrayed by wellness, which is really what I write about. I want to talk here. about for, that some. Yeah. 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 For all the reasons that yeah. you, because, because of the construct, not because of the origins or the source of the wisdom, but because of the way in which, it, which it's been interpreted, adapted, stolen, mm-hmm. right? Like stolen yeah. from indigenous people, exploited. <laughs> and what I want to say is that somehow through that process, I was led back to the church to you. Because what you were speaking to me went beyond the house, which is why it's so ironic that the house burned. Yes. Ooh. But the spirit is still there. You know, the house being like the, the construct, the architecture, yeah, right. the, the house burned, but the spirit was there. And I wasn't called to the house as much as I was called to you. And I was called to this idea that you were putting out there that God is love and that God is beyond and that God is more. Uh, so, um, this was on Richard Rohr's, um, CAC is the name of it. What is it, Sarah? The contemplative CAC radical grace. I can't remember what his. So his Instagram is CAC radical grace. And this was from a podcast between, uh, Carrie Kelly and Reverend Jackie Lewis. Um, and the one thing that Carrie Kelly said that just, hit my ears and I was like, merciful heavens was she said the house burned down, but the spirit was still there. Mm -hmm. Mm. And that was such a beautiful metaphor for me because I was at an event the past few days for work and, um, and there were these worship songs playing in this, in this church and a friend of mine who has kind of, been on this journey similar to ours, I think of just seeing things bigger than within that construct of a, of a house. Um, and we were singing a song and it was, it was to God, of course, cause it was a worship song. And then in, in our space, they call those vertical songs cause it's human to God. Um, and, and this person next to me, um, started singing it back to themselves. Mm. And I know that might scare a whole bunch of people, but it is this person's belief and also my belief for what it's worth that God is in us, Mm -hmm. not outward Mm -hmm. from us. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, and you know, he, he knew I was listening and that I heard that. And it was such an interesting thought Mm -hmm. to think of, you know, God being in us and how we, we walk around or, and if God is the wrong word for you, if you prefer divine or, or the universe or whatever, but that we have that connectedness and that consciousness that we were talking about when I said, like, you know, I pause and say, you are a part of me, mm-hmm. like, so is the divine. And, you know, if we are made in God's image or the divine's image, then together we are truly family and we are connected. And anyway, when she just said that, that was such a good metaphor for where I'm at. I feel like in my faith, like there is no real building holding it all together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it, it's so much bigger than a building and it's so much wider and 
you know, more than I could even imagine. One of the things that I'm thankful for in that, and this is my own experience, is that I feel like the building that I get to inhabit right now, though, is my body. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Yeah, it's like at least I have some sort of framework to go like, there's this thing I don't understand, but because of like a pain that I have right here, right below my clavicle, like that might be able to help me understand you know, either my Mm -hmm. spiritual perspective or my personal perspective or my judgments or whatever it is. And so it's like, it, it, it's really fascinating to me that it's like, and and much like what we were talking about earlier from the tragedy and hope thing, it's like, I just think all of this stuff is way bigger than we are solely and individually. And it makes me think of like the corporeal soul where they say like, you get half your soul from your mom and dad and you get half your soul from the divine. Whoa, I've never heard that before. Yeah. yeah. And and so it's like if your soul is comprised of mom and dad and the divine and the divine is all of us, then we are all connected. Mm. Right. Exactly. That's really to me, that's really um, that's comforting and beautiful and, and just really brings to light what I think you're talking about, Moose, of that. Like, like you, will you say it again? You are me and I am you. What's the. Oh, just uh, you are a part of me is what I've been saying. Um, I, I just think that's really cool. Yeah, me too. So I would say that there's probably a list of like 10 to 15 women that over my lifetime have like really impacted kind of my worldview and inspired me in so many ways. And on that list is Oprah Winfrey and Katie Couric. Don't laugh. And, um, my Angelou and Elizabeth Gilbert, um, and those type of people and Lamont would be on that list. Um, and you know, it's been a while since I've added anyone to that list just because a lot of those have been like rooted in, you know, my teenage to twenties. And, um, but I came across Mel Robbins on Instagram and I know a lot of people follow her Hmm. and she's just like this. I would call her a coach. I don't, I'm pretty sure she's a coach. Um, but she's also like brilliant at business and brilliant at, you know, personal self-help and really just like a joy to watch. Um, but she's like a badass too. And I know lots of people follow her, but there was this one this week that just brought me a lot of joy. And I thought it would be a good thing to share before we close today. And I'll go ahead and read what she says. Um, on the little part of Instagram. What's that called? Yeah. When your life feels like it's going off the rails, the only way to get back on track is focusing on the little things that you do every single day. You have been underestimating the compounding ripple effect of getting the little things right. When you get the little things right, the big things will take care of themselves. Mm. And here's what she said. Your life goes off the rails, everybody, in one of two ways. You either have some massively tragic sudden thing happen, or you make tiny, small, negative decisions that aren't aligned with who you are. And those small, tiny, negative decisions start to take your life in an entirely different direction. The good news is this. You get your life on track. You reach your dreams. You become the person you're supposed to be, that you dream of being. You hear the call of what's meant for you the exact same way by focusing on the tiny little things that lead to what you want. You see, you underestimate, so did I, the compounding effect, the ripple effect of just getting the little things right. When you focus on getting the little things right, the big things take care of themselves. Because guess what? Your whole life is the little things, and we worry about the big stuff. It's the little things that are everything. Wow. Hmm. She has another new follower today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Woo. Amazing. Those little things are hard, you guys. Yeah. Special thanks to our producer, Sarah Reed. To find out more, go to catandmoosepodcast.com. is 
is a BP production. 